Hello friends, Rosa Scheib here again with another review. Uh, this is episode 7, Frederick and Tanya. Oh. <sighs> kind of knew Mulvey and Trenton as soon as Leon showed up, you know. Hoping they weren't got, but kind of knew they were got. It was very interesting how that all went down. I was kind of rooting for them. Maybe they were getting recruited from the Dark Army. Maybe they're not. Uh, I mean, Sam Esmail likes to basically toy with our emotions. And so I'm just going to get straight to it, pull the Band-Aid off, and just talk about the Trenton and Moby uh, storyline first. Uh, the last time we saw them was the, the teaser end of Season 2, where Leon met with Trenton and Moby, uh, or Frederick and Tanya, outside of the Arizona Fries. They were talking about uh, possibly undoing what has been done, what's going on in the news, that they needed to say something. Moby was kind of not for it. Trenton was like, you know, we can recreate the keys, basically the keys that to encrypt the e-coin, uh, not e-coin, but e-corps servers, get undo things, get back, everything back online. Uh, basically, the global economy as we know it would maybe perhaps end. Uh, Leon shows up again, asks for the time, and basically my understanding, and um, I had to go a little bit on Reddit to, to look at this, that's probably like, as far as the, the in-universe timeline, they were having that conversation when basically either right before or at, at, as the buildings, like right before the buildings had blown up. So at that point, it was just uh, the economic doldrums were going on and them trying to recreate and undo the, as uh, the rant that Darlene talked about um, in the subway, you know, the stealing of other people's wealth, not helping the little person, but basically enabling, you know, E-Corp to be stronger. So there was that, and so when we get kind of back with them, they're watching the TV coverage of the 71 buildings that were um, destroyed. Um, their roommate that, that Moby's friend was killed by Leon, and they're all, you know, they're tied up, waiting, and <laughs> Leon's conversating with them, uh, telling them to kind of be quiet, it's okay, he's, you know, basically their babysitter, uh, talking a little bit about Frazier as he's in the car and stuff. Um, you know, trying to tell Moby not to be brave, you know, look at their roommate. Uh, they get into a Cadillac and they're driving out of the desert and, you know, Leon's having his philosophy how, like, you know, he had a friend tell him about Frazier and how he didn't understand Frazier. He, he could disconnect reality when he came to television, but he didn't understand how this bald-headed white guy in Seattle could get smashed as much. He didn't kind of believe that. And he started talking about, you know, now Michael Knight from Knight Rider, which is very funny. Uh, he can believe that, you know, and look at what Knight Riders did. It was like 30 years ago and was talking about, you know, technology and the mergers of man, which is, you know, future telling, if, if you will. And he thinks that Knight Riders is a very unrated, underrated show. And then like the Knight Rider theme came on. And to keep up with the Horus theme, I, I kind of got this wrong when I talked about the live uh, reaction and, um, oh God, totally, I apologize that I, I don't remember your name. Uh, but mm -hmm. in the comment section for that, uh, it was pointed out to me that the, the movie I was thinking of that had Paul Walker in it was Joyrider. And uh, it was actually a truck driver that was chasing him and his brother and, and, and uh, his girlfriend across the desert. Uh, different scenario, but the, the Ruckard Hager movie was Hitchhiker with Thomas C. Howe. And it was very reminiscent, of, to me at least, those desert type movies where you or either some stranger shows up into a strange town and there's some weirdness, like, you know, he'll have eyes. Uh, with, like, the remake was kind of like that. Um, or you're, you know, you're driving across the desert and you encounter, you know, a stranger and you pick the stranger up, which was the hitchhiker theme, and uh, you're getting chased across the desert and stuff. But just that whole scene of Moby and, and Trenton, uh, with Leon in the, in the car going out the desert was just very reminiscent to me personally um, thematically and just visually of those type of films uh, kind of the very dark horror-esque of the situation that everybody's in and given their fate the fact that they had to bury their friend out in the desert um, is you know kind of fits with that and kind of foreshadowing what their fate was going to be um, there was a bit of comedy errors. It turns out that Trenton 
because she's a city girl, does not know how to drive, and she ended up smashing um, the car into the uh, rock. And for half a second, I thought maybe, you know, she would have got up and started running away, but I guess if you think about it, she probably like banged herself up, you know, against the steering wheel. There probably wasn't an airbag or anything like that, so it's very unfortunate, if you will. Um, lock picking people, uh, as the hackers do, they learn how to lock pick, and she locked her pick. She was, she and Trent uh, Moby were uh, handcuffed by bike locks, and she was able to undo the undo the lock and get out. Um, that's how she was able to get out of her vines. Leon wasn't in the car. He was actually digging the hole for their friend, their roommate, if you will, out in the middle of nowhere. And they're trying to, you know, they're trying to figure out what they want, thinking they have skill sets for the Dark Army. They know he's from the Dark Army. And uh, there's, you know, no sauce, no way of talking their way out of this. Um, Leon takes them back to their place, their apartment that they were in, where he had them captive and killed the roommate. Um, it turns out the Dark Army was there, taking away their computers and stuff. And Leon is like, you know, kind of like you guys. You're kind of like Elaine. And when they were digging the, the hole in the dirt, like Elaine and George, you got the funny quality. I'm rooting for you. And for a moment there, you, you had some hope. Maybe the Dark Army is recruiting them. Um, much like Tara Wellick was recruited by the Dark Army. But no, um, it's because they fit a certain narrative. And I didn't think the show would go this way, but understanding what, I guess, the overall White Rose's plan, and we'll get into White Rose in a moment there, uh, it kind of makes sense uh, why the Dark Army did what they did. Um, so the uh, White Rose's henchman, the number two, if you will, uh, comes in and says that uh, come with him to the garage. They go to the garage and there's a setup. And there's these computers and plans and table outlets. And he asks them to look at what they see. And Mobley and Trent are looking at it. And they're saying that's, you know, airline maps. The malware is already written. They're still trying to say, you know, they have skills and resources. And he goes, yeah, you have those things. But they're, they're not what we need from the Dark Army. What we need from you is right here. The story you were going to tell. And the Dark Army believes in self-sacrifice. They believe in sacrificing themselves for the greater good. Um, I guess what makes them superior to everybody else, really, is that they all believe this. They're all committed to this. Um, they believe in they're doing a higher purpose. Which is, I guess, the, I want to say the umpteenth time, but third or fourth time this has been stated with a, a higher purpose. I have no one really knows what the higher purpose is. Is it tied to the Washington Township plant? What the hell is White Rose's plan? Um, is it really just, you know, China taking over the world? I mean, what is this higher purpose? It's very cult-like following that the White Rose has with the Dark Army. And um, so the Dark Army henchmen and the Red Mask um, have put out some guns. They first uh, give the gun to Moby. And now are trying to make him um, kill himself. He's begging for his life. We actually don't see it happen. Um, at the same time this is happening, you have Santiago and Dom in a command center as uh, the FBI SWAT team is coming to their house that uh, people have um, basically had been um, informing on, saying that this is the location of uh, the terrorists. There had been a bolo put out of their faces. And... Um, we'll get into that, but basically, you know, Tyra Wellick said that these two were the head of F Society, which was also a confirmation from the Patsy guy uh, that did the video, earlier video, earlier in the season. So when they got there and they get into the, the garage in place, um, the, the story that um, was being told was basically that Triton and Moby um, are the heads of F Society. They're about to take out... Uh, some the third attack um, airlines and that they're actually working for Iranians they had the F society stuff but they also had Iranian flags in the area and considering that they're both of Middle Eastern descent is putting back again the narrative back to White Rose told um, that Kobe the mouthpiece of his to place all the blame to Iran um, and basically pivot uh, the story narrative of society of uh, basically being Iranian terrorists and this will put the US government against Iran and then eventually maybe cause some kind of war if you will. Uh, Dom didn't buy the narrative. Uh, we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, 
but that was the story being told. Um, we'll add some color to that a little bit later when we talk about Tyra Wellick. But uh, I'm just going to miss Trenton and Moby, particularly Trenton, because I felt of the hackers in the group, um, besides Elliot, even more so than Darlene, I felt that Trenton was probably the most confident of the hackers. Um, there was a reason why Darlene went back to her in season two, saying that they needed her, needed her skill set. Uh, when you saw the introduction of Moby and Trenton, she was already hacking into Moby's phone. She had very strong social engineering skills. Even Mr. Robot commented about her, about how she was like, you know, kind of uh, quipping about her being a jihadist a little bit, you know, a la hala, making a pretty little bit of a racist joke, if you will, about her, but at the same time talk, speaking truth about her skill set. And... This speaks into it, it to her in a sense that uh, when she, they were in the car with Moby and something to this she had said um, in the stinger of uh, last season two about recreating the crypto, cryptographic keys and maybe we'll unlock and un, uncrypt, uh, decrypt, I'm sorry, decrypt the, the eCorp servers is that she had an auto send email that would uh, send out information to a person that she trusted. And I saw this theory online, uh, it's not an, an new theories an old theory that Trenton might have been an actually an FBI informant. I didn't buy it at first. Um, there's something even started like way back in season one and a little bit more in season two simply because I thought it was a little too key, cliche, you know, Middle Eastern hacker working for the FBI as an informant, possibly because, you know, of, you know, the war on terror and stuff like that. But it could be the case given the sense um, when Dom having not bought the narrative, having been a little bit pissed about San Diego and the way he's handling things. And we'll get back to San Diego because he's a complete douche um, and corrupt as hell. Uh, not buying the narrative, buying the story, seeing it, that the tight, neat bow of, you know, Trin and Moby dead by suicide, by handgun, uh, in the garage with a third attack, this third attack that they had gotten this video for, from which stated that the great acts of sorcery were gonna occur and uh, another attack was imminent within 24 hours. This is why the FBI went <laughs> rapid fire with this, with the, you know, putting pressure and stuff and going after them and fitting really the narrative of this being an Iranian terrorist plot plan type of a deal um, that San Diego was helping, you know, White Rose shape. Um, she wasn't buying it. She leaves the command center. Santiago says, look, you know, I wanted them to get, you know, get captured alive too. Um, but that just, just didn't happen to them, but it's still, you know, basically a win or whatever. And kind of put it in her face a little bit. They, we'll, we'll get back to that when we talk about Santiago, but she leaves. Um, she goes back to the conspiracy board that I saw oh, from, uh, last season where it had all the names and she showed it to Darlene and Trenton's name was on there, but her face and picture weren't. And many people were also going on to that that maybe because she was a CI an informant and you wouldn't want to put your informant's face on the board because not everyone's supposed to know and stuff like that keep their identity safe so given the fact that she is dead given the fact that she has this auto send email thing with information that she uh, was basically recreating with even without Moby's help uh, the cryptographic keys to decrypt eCorp the theory out there is that maybe she's sending this email out to Dom because Dom might have been her handler. Um, I'm not sure that's the case. Um, even if Dom was her handler, you know, I don't know how it was that Santiago wasn't aware that she was an informant because that would actually look bad to the FBI that their informant was also a terrorist and that this informant wasn't, you know, informing or CI or human, you know, was a human, whatever it is that Santiago through the term that Santiago threw at uh, Darlene. So, uh, in kind of in cap that scene there, um, which was pretty much the end of the show, really, was um, Dom putting a question mark and a yellow piece of paper with White Rose's name on it and putting it above Tyra Wellick, and basically saying that she's, you know, you really are going to get away with it. And it seems like at this point that White Rose is really going to get away with the narrative of pitting the U.S. government versus, you know, Iran, that Ab society is an Iranian terrorist group. I'm not sure what purpose overall that does. I don't know why 
she still wants Elliot alive. I think he, at this point he's probably fulfilled his purpose, but um, we'll see. Maybe there's more. Maybe it has to do with the Washington Township plant. Maybe there's an insight that Elliot has that we might make actually the plant complete, given the fact that Elliot's father helped design the plant. I'm not exactly sure why White Rose has kept Elliot, Darlene, or Angela Moss alive. Well, we kind of know with Angela Moss, and we'll get into that when we talk about White Rose. But overall, why these characters are still alive beyond just, you know, they're the main characters of the show. Um, but yeah, that was very tragic, very heartbreaking. I was just, I was kind of rooting for them, just like Leon, but this just wasn't in the cards and it makes sense for the show uh the body count is getting higher there's consequences for the decisions that all these characters have made and other characters are made on their behalf um the fact that that um you know took place it's just it sucks it really sucks and i hope i know that darlene has a vengeance pact with um elliot but i hope vengeance you know occurs for both moby and trent i mean Basically, Romero, Moby, and Trent are now dead, and all that's left of the original F Society group is Elliot and Darlene, and, and in a technical sense, you know, Mr. Robot. Um, everyone else, um, you know, is captured as far as the exterior F Society people, the ones that did the, the bull um, ball drop thing. Uh, Cisco, dead, you know, uh, a lot of that group is dropping like flies. Even Angela getting recruited, I, I think her number's up honestly do I think she's fulfilled her purpose um, I also think Krista's numbers up and we'll talk about Krista so so Elliot you know uh, the show opens up really um, kind of you know intercuts all these different different um, parts of the story they seem to be occurring all pretty much around the same time so with Elliot, he sees, you know, we get back to him and he's he's watching the event like everybody else at, uh, outside of a, a TV shop or some electronic shop. And he he panics. He, he puts his hood up. He walk, runs away and he runs to Krista. And he is, you know, in a manic state. You know, he's like, I can't, I, I can't believe I did this. I did this. I, I don't understand. I mean, I really did this. It's not just him. It's me. Really, it's me. And Krista's like, calm down. What's going on? And she's like, Elliot, what are you trying to say? And Elliot glitches out and Mr. Robot shows up. So Krista starts talking to Mr. Robot and she goes, why is Elliot panicking? Why did he come here? And he, Mr. Robot's like, of course he would come to you. <laughs> you know, I'm so, and he's like, I'm tired of this. Why won't Elliot talk to me directly? And Krista's like, well, maybe he doesn't want to talk to you directly. Maybe he's afraid of you. Maybe what is it you have done that Elliot is so afraid of? And that's when Mr. Robot kind of spills his beans and saying, you know, this is my revolution, you know, F Society was my cause, it's been subverted, these people just, you know, he didn't, I don't think he said in the conversation that the Dark Army has taken it, but these people have taken it, perverted it, made it into something else, I need to get, get back at them, and, <clears throat> you know, Krista's kind of, kind of taking and absorbing this in, and she's like, you're saying that you, you, a part of F society or you believe you believe in the F society cause he goes I am F society this is my revolution so Chris is taking all this in and you know Mr. Robot eventually leaves and, and, and Elliot leaves as Mr. Robot leaving this you know there's no point in this conversation he's going to leave he's going to go get back at the people that um you know subverted his revolution basically and Krista you know she contacts her lawyer and she goes you know I have this patient and He's confessing to me that he committed acts of terrorism and the lawyer said, you know, you know, did he say he was going to commit more acts of terrorism? I mean, you, you can lose your license, your, your, uh, career, you know, you can't tell the FBI, you can't go to the police. She goes, you know, and even Mr. Robot broke it down. Like she, cause Chris is like not really believing Mr. Rowe, because uh, he's, you know, he has delusions of grandeur. He goes, let's, let's think about it. Elliot's a hacker. He came here because he was a hacker. He hacked you. He hacked a boyfriend. Do you really think he's, you know, out of the realm of possibility that he's not the F Society, you know, head? And Krista's thinking of this, like, you know, it is within the realm of possibility that her patient 
um, who is a hacker might have been able to do this. And her lawyer's like, you know, do you know how many lunatics are saying that they're part of M Society and are responsible for this? Do you really want to inundate that the NYPD and FBI with something like this? You know, something that could cause you to lose your license. And Krista is racked with guilt because she's like, I have to say something. And her lawyer's telling her you can't say anything because he didn't say he was going to commit other further acts of violence. And you don't know if he's actually committed these acts of violence because he's a delusional person. And so you can see the, the, the ethical dilemma that Krista has. And I think she is going to say something. I think she is going to tell the FBI and it's going to get to Santiago, which we'll get to next. Um, and that's going to be the end of Krista because I was saying in the beginning of the season when I teased a little bit about the season that Krista needs to stop being Elliot's therapist and get the hell out of Dodge because everyone around him is basically dying. He's very, he's dangerous as Mr. Robot. He's even dangerous as Elliot, but he's just, you know, people dying. The, the whole purpose of the revolution is that no one's supposed to really know all the players and Chris is going to know one know uh, one of those players and she's going to get got by that and it's I uh, it's unfortunate I think because it seems like Krista is the only one of the very few people um, that's not manipulating Elliot for a particular cause or concern is actually there for legitimately for the concern of her patient who is Elliot in helping him and because of her doing her duty, her due diligence as you know, a therapist, as a psychiatrist, it's going to get her got, much in the sense of Gideon, really, how Gideon got got, um, which is tragic and sad. Uh, I'm knocking on wood for her. Maybe she'll survive the season. I, I, I doubt it, though. So we're going to leave Elliot for a moment. We talked about Krista. Let's talk about Santiago. So... Santiago is a scumbag. He works for the Dark Army. He's in charge of tracking down the F Society members. Great position to be when you are in a, an informant for and in the pocket of the Dark Army. Um, he's sitting down with, um, with Tyrell Wellick's lawyer. And the lawyer's like, you know, my Kylan, 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 <clears throat> my Kylan was held hostage. Uh, he's not responsible for these actions. They took him because of his access. He... You know, he didn't, you know, he didn't do any of the things that were being said he was made to do it because his wife and child were threatened. And Santiago was like, bullshit. And Don was really like, bullshit. He murdered Sarah, you know, Sarah Knowles, you know, uh, Susan Knowles. He was wanted for murder. Uh, he was a CTO or acting CTO. He, in Santiago point, he activated that server. He put it on the honeypot. Um... And he got fired all on the same day, and he disappears. And this, and the guys, and then now he goes out and shouts out that you know about these attacks in front of one of the target buildings, and and the guys, what you're gonna arrest him for coincidence? What hard evidence do you have? Uh, he barely escaped. He wants to see his wife and kids. That they were threatening his wife and child. What was he supposed to do? And the lawyer pointed out, and he was cleared of those murders that murder he didn't do it so Don was like he this no we're gonna charge him with obstruction of justice he's gonna charge with um, you know he's gonna be charged with you know with terrorist acts he's he's not gonna get away with this and the lawyer is like you're gonna really do that with this this guy who's willing to talk when there's a third attack in Emmett and you know you want the FBI to be responsible for another attack you know uh, happening and, and Santiago is sitting there and he's like playing his part if you will and, and Tom's looking at him like do you know this fucking bullshit and Santiago says we have to basically cut a deal with Tyra Wellick she goes this is bullshit he is part of this he's you know we can't do this and he goes <laughs> you know and she's like She's yelling at him, and he's like, and he reminds her, you know, he goes, oh, she goes, this is stinks. All this stinks. And she's like really kind of looking at him, accusing him, and he goes, I need to remind you that you work for me. All right? And he kind of like chews her out. And, uh, you know, Dom's not having any of this. She thinks it's, you know, and she's right, it is bullshit. 
Tara Welk was fully fucking part of this and she knows it instinctually but she can't really prove it. She doesn't really have the backing of her supervisor who because he's Dark Army is um, you know supporting the narrative. Uh, we get a little personal tidbit which might be something that might, he get, might get got for um, a little bit because he is under significant scrutiny from within the FBI uh, because he survived as he stated to <laughs> Um, White Rose's henchman, uh, Irvin, you know, he survived the, the attack. Uh, a lot of mistakes have happened, you know, um, even though he's kind of gotten some of these wins, you know, with the Tyrell Willock and catching the F Society of video, uh, video guy, the fake video guy. Um, you know, he's still under certain scrutiny and stuff like that. Um, his mother calls him. <laughs> she apparently told other people that you know just stay in their homes that day and he's like you shouldn't have told anybody mom just she goes that she's afraid to go out he goes just just stay home i'll make sure you get stuff i you know i love you um then um you know one of the agents comes in and he had been with tyra wellick he was interviewing tyra wellick he hands tyra wellick a book of suspects um a bunch of pictures come up one of them is elliot he goes you know, i need you to point out to the suspects, the people that held you hostage, the people that are head of F Society. He comes in and he says that Tyra Wallet confirmed um, our two suspects, the same two suspects that are our F Society videographer, the vi guy that made the video. You know, San Diego goes, all right, let's put a bolo out, let's get them. And the guy's like, are you sure about that? And he goes like, what? And, he, and the guy kind of leaves. Um, he goes, you know, the guy before leaving says, you know, he keeps asking about his wife and kid. And San Diego says, I'll take care of it. Uh, so those two suspects were, in fact, you know, um, Mobley and Trenton. That's why the bullet was put out. That's why um, the FBI was looking for them. That's why the FBI broke into their little house, a little apartment place, into the garage. You know, they, you know, they've basically been set up from the very beginning, kind of, in a sense. Um, so San Diego, <laughs> God, complete dick. Very evil, very evil. Uh, goes into the room, turns off the video, and says, "We can we can talk openly." And Tyrell's not really talking because you know he knows who he knows who Santiago works for. But he also knows what he's done. And um, he goes, "I hear you've been talking about your wife and child." And he goes, "Yeah, I want to see my wife and kids." And he goes, "Yeah, well, here's the deal. <laughs> your wife is dead. She was murdered. Lover squirrel." And, and Tyrell, I don't believe you. He goes, yeah, you know, the dude she was banging, she, and he shot her point blank in the head. She's dead. And your your son is in the uh, foster care system upstate. I hear it's really good. You know, one out of five, only one out of five kids get abused up there. And Tyrell looks like, you're lying. I don't believe you. You're lying. And he goes, you know, if you tell anybody what I've done and who I am, um, I'm going to see to it that your son becomes a statistic, you know becomes one of those unfortunate souls that get lost in the system and <laughs> this is the leverage that uh, a, a Dark Army has on Tyra Welk and he freaks the fuck out he doesn't believe him but he goes you know I got your son basically and he, then he gets up and turns the camera back on and Tyra Welk just he starts breaking down he starts screaming you know um, I think, personally, that Tower Wallach is going to kill Santiago. <laughs> I personally believe that. I, I think he, he has such anger issues. He really loved his wife. Um, he loves his kid. And that even though he can't get at Dark Army, he's going to kill Santiago. He's just going to flip out and he's going to kill Santiago. Um, just as a, a means of getting some kind of vengeance for the death of his wife because I'm sure he blames Dark Army for it. Uh, so there's that. Uh, I guess you could say the plan that was given to Tyra Wellick um, last episode was that he was to pretend that he was handcuffed to a bed, that he was to flee through the tunnel and um, tell the FBI that he was held hostage that the narrative White Rose had been, um, as we know earlier in the season, had been massaging his reputation, if you will, in the public, keeping it in good faith that he's not really a bad guy at all. Um, possibly his wife was working in tangent to that. 
Uh, he was freed. Now we know he was freed and cleared of the murder that he did commit. And he is going to become the face or positive face of all of this that, you know, the wrong guy that got wrong, lost his, lost his wife. Um, tragic narrative story that will, um, not sure what it will do, but it will, I guess, help the narrative of keeping and completing that um, Iran is responsible for F Society and not the fact that it's this uh, dumbass, naive person from basically New Jersey named Elliot Alderson. Um, there's that. Um, yeah, let's get into Elliot because I think White Rose is a little. What happened with White Rose this episode is a little bit more power, important than Elliot. So, Elliot goes sees Krista. Uh, he turns into Mr. Robot. Uh, he leaves Krista's and goes to Irvin's uh, car repair car sales place. You know, not surprised he knew the location. He gets in there, realizes nobody's about. You can kind of see or sense that there's really nobody about. I mean, it's a tragic day. You know, um, we can hear in the background, um, and we'll get into Angela and Darlene. Um, you know, the the toll is four thousand, which is more than nine eleven across seventy one locations across the state, across the country. So, everyone, every state has been hit by this. Everyone's going to know someone who worked within those buildings that was um, associated with those buildings, things of that nature. Um, see um so he gets there he, he sees Irvin in the garage repairing and he starts yelling at Irvin he goes you guys subverted my revolution like almost like a child this is not what I wanted this is not the purpose of it and he gets knocked out by the dark army goons um I want to say it's the same goons that you know maybe flew over to Arizona and already killed Trent and Wobley and flew back or what is it like go ahead three and a half hour flight if you take basically the direct route if you will from Phoenix to New York um, so they they take him and knock his ass out um, he wakes up it's still Mr. Robot it's not Elliot um, Irvin's all dressed up out of his mechanic clothes and he tells Elliot to get out of the car and he shows Mr. Robot Mr. Elliot you know there's this party up on this top high rise and this person is playing the fiddle, you know, like in Rome, you know, who was it? Nero uh, played the fiddle as Rome burned. Um, I think that's who it was, one of those emperors. Could have been Caligula. It's been a long time um, since I've done any of that Roman history stuff. Um, and these people are like partying and, and Herman's like, look at that. Your revolution was paid and bought for by those people. And he's like, those people are going to still exist. Look at them. 4,000 people and they're partying. Partying like nothing ever happened. They're partying like it's a great grand old time. Nothing's going to change. What do you think was going to happen? Basically calling him like a child, basically. A naive child. And he goes, and Mr. Ross like, wait, you're going to the party? And everyone looks at him and goes, no. Um, one of the senators is in our pocket. And his mistress um, <laughs> took the wrong, the wrong stuff, and she's dead in the, in the bathroom. And I'm going in there to clean it up, fix it, basically. And he goes, look at that. These people are partying, and there's a dead mistress in the bathroom. And I'm here to make it right. <laughs> and he walks away and leaves uh, Mr. Robot Elliot there. And it... I think it was a very important thing because we were all rooting, let's say so, we were all rooting as fans for stage two to happen because we were like, yeah, let's get the corporation, the bad, evil corporation, let's take them down. Oh, they killed your dad? Yeah, you know, kind of a deal. And then it happens and we see the totality of being committed to that type of revolution and how it was subverted and really wasn't really the people's revolution, if you will, or an individualistic, you know, Skywalker act, taking down the empire type of a deal. It's, you know, what the big boys do all the time and you were just co-opted, if you will, and the world doesn't change. 
it just keeps on spinning doing the same bullshit over and over again you know you really honestly thought you were going to change things and i think it kind of probably deflated and popped the bubble of some of us as fans who might have been rooting for f society a little bit you know take it down kind of a deal and it is very naive you know it's um while revolutionary in thinking and thought it doesn't fit within the reali reality of the world really revolutions are bloody revolutions um i think i've said it's before in previous reviews um you know death occurs you don't change the entire course of human existence by sitting down at a table and talking it out it's it's always been gun and blood and it's always been you know sometimes the powerful is a version of the powerful getting on top and there's no real winners and sometimes in some cases revolutions is just a case of a musical chairs um which is the political concept where you know you're just changing out leaders you're not really changing out anything you're just kind of like substituting really and it's no real significant change and i don't know where they're going from there i mean this is episode seven yeah frederick and tanya is episode seven so we got eight nine and ten plus two more seasons uh i'm not gonna jump on the time theory bandwagon but it, are we going to war um is this going to get undone um, is trend I'm gonna get back to trends email a little bit, but I mean Where is Samuel Smell taking us? I mean, this is a great season one great episode after another. I hope they keep the momentum going um, It was like five six seven three in a row just fantastical episodes um, Best like I said in live review probably the best television I've seen in a very long time this is one of the very few shows where I honestly don't care if i get all the answers i'm just happy for the journey uh, unlike like lost or x files or babylon 5 those are examples i've given um you know there's so much goodness in here that i'm satisfied you know and it's probably the first time i've ever thought about it i, I watch this type of genre of television and movies and and books all the time and i i like the answers like i don't like give it being necessarily given the answers directly uh, you know, you can spend fifty and I can figure it out, but I this is so mind boggling and it's it's not like um uh, was it M Night Shyamalan where there's like a twist or whatever or some bullshit ex machia thing. Like they've layered enough of the hints and clues throughout each of these episodes or even the season that if you go back and look back and go, Oh, that little thing that I didn't really notice actually mattered. And building off to where certain decisions and acts happen that you uh, didn't really realize the importance like for example um, I saw this in through the reddit forums and for example Tyra Wellick spoke about the first season so season yeah season one when he's trying to make a speech for the CTO and why um, we should should pick him and he's saying you know there's 71 vulnerabilities within um, evil corp that we need to and he was doing that speech and well, yeah, you know, there, there's 71 buildings that have blown up. Um, those were the vulnerabilities. Um, so <laughs> little things like that. Um, yeah, so this is just kind of little things like that to kind of build into the narrative there. And I don't know. I, again, I don't know where they're where they're taking us in this journey, but obviously the revolution has been subverted. The revolution may not, in fact, have been on at all. And there, I said it from the very beginning, probably the crunch end of season one. There are no bad, you know, good guys in this show. They're all bad guys to to a degree. You know, from Angela to Elliot, Darlene. You know, um, I don't. Probably the only really good person is Dom, but because she works for the FBI and the U.S. government, you she's got that stench on her of that mantle even though she is a good person maybe Chris is a good person but everybody else you know dark army white rose phil price all them bad 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 people everybody pretty much is a bad person it's done bad acts bad things um so all right so let's talk about darlene and angela so <laughs> darlene and angela are watching the television 
Angela is just completely just broken um, in a very delusional state. Um, Darlene doesn't know what to do. Well, she kind of knows. You know, she's dealt with Elliot in his episodes, so I think she knows how to handle kind of someone who's a little bit off, if you will. But it's obvious that Dar that Angela's not home right now, and she's watching that, and she's saying the numbers keep climbing. She and Darlene's like, let's maybe stop watching the television. Let's calm down a bit. And and Angela she kept saying, you know, the people are going to be okay, right? The people, they, you know, the people are going to be okay. Everything's gonna be okay, and Tony's looking at her like, "You crazy ass bitch," you, you know. And she's asking her, "Are there more attacks? Are there, are there more attacks happening?" And Angel's like, "I don't know anything else. I don't know anything. People are gonna be okay." And she keeps he hitting, like, watching the explosion and watching the rewind button, re hitting the rewind bu button, which was in the descriptor for. <laughs> this episode and it caused the people that are into the uh time stream theory brigade to go into tizzy about that descriptor for this episode you know angela hits the rewind button and she's literally hitting the rewind button clever there guys clever um <laughs> so darlene goes and says she's going to get her shit and come back and she does and she comes back and there's angela still at the television hitting the rewind button and and Angela's like, you know, come here, come here. You, you can see it. You can see it. Let me show you. And she plays, like, the explosion when the building said uh, from a news report saying this was caught um, across the street of, I guess, some employees or whatever. They were filming what's happening. And he goes, look. And she goes, look. And then she hits the mirror. See? They're okay. And plays it. And, and Tarly's looking at her and like, you know, look. See that? They're okay. And she's gone. She's like, you know, responsible for the death of 4,000 people. Gone. Her mind cannot handle it. Um, don't know what Darlene's going to do. Don't know what her status is with the FBI. I know Santiago and Dom had a conversation in the office about Darlene, about how she really hadn't given them shit or anything like that. Dom was like, we need to get Elliot and Angela and, and, and Darlene, take them in here and find Dark Army and stuff. And, you know, this is a part of the conversation where Sandiago was like, this is not Dark Army. Get off of that. You know, you know, she's like, we need to go to the president. There's about to be a third hack, a attack. He goes, we can't go there with this myth or whatever. There's no hard facts. There's no point in rounding these people up. We, we have Tower Wellick. That's the deal we made. We're going to go with him. He's going to give us and we're going to stop this third attack. And that's when, that's why he rubbed it in Dom's face. Because, you know, they got, you know, Mobley and Trenton killed Frederick and Tanya and stuff. And so, I don't know where Dar Darlene's status is. I, I put a question mark on her because, again, we don't sure why why rose is keeping elliot alive and the only reason why elliot's alive you know darlene's alive is because of elliot you know uh she's his sister she, she's i think why rose knows about mr robot that personality she's his trigger um he can kind of she can kind of control him a little bit she's been very helpful for him or whatever mr robot so i think that's why she's still alive uh we know the reason why angela's alive when we get into the white rose story but Angela's broken. I don't. I don't know if she's going to talk to somebody. If she's going to freak out some more. What her actions are going to be. Uh, I'm not sure if she's. The clock's ticking on her. But again, the show can surprise us. Uh, maybe Angela will snap out of it. I don't know. But it's very clear that she's. A broken individual right now she was already kind of broken she was already kind of fragile she she tried to forge and move herself forward into this and and do this plan and she's just not made the of the stuff to do something like this she never was and she kind of did denial 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 to keep the reality what her actions out as like kind of like what Elliot yelled at her um, during last episode you know do you have any idea what you've done what they're about to do when it was just one building and um yeah and clearly she wasn't in on the whole entire plan um or maybe she was maybe that's why she emphasized the evacuation plan um and clearly it wasn't 
but maybe she thought it was one Billy. Not really sure. Um, we don't know because while well, Angela had Elliot as Mr. Robot, we don't really know what happened during that weekend period. I don't know if we're going to get a flashback and Mr. Robot did have a plan, played a part, but didn't realize the full totality of what part he played. But um, we definitely know that Tyra Wellick was the one who came up with the 71 building plan. Um, and had the full weight of the Dark Army behind him. So, speaking of the Dark Army, uh, I kind of actually feel very sorry for Phil Price. I never thought I would. I never thought I would feel that sorry for him. He's a bad guy. He's an awful human being. But I actually kind of feel very sorry for him. So, we're back at the Mar-a-Lago. Mar it's basically the same day of the attack. All these events are happening within the same day. And he's, he's back. And, he come, and White Rose is like, talking to some other corporate guy and he, the corporate other corporate person sees Philip Price and leaves and Philip Price sits down and White Rose is like, I'm surprised with what, all the things that are on your plate that you're here. And Philip Price just looks at him and goes, you got everything you wanted. I, I gave you the Congo vote. You know, um, you have your plant. You know, why come after me? You know, what was the purpose of all that? And they're having this conversation, this tit for tat. And basically, he, Wade, Wade Rose has been, you know, the puppet master, really, of even Philip Price. He, you know, Philip Price made that whole big speech about how he's the most, wants to be the most powerful person in the room. And maybe there's one or two other people that are more powerful than him. And definitely, White Rose was one of those people. But maybe it, it was a grand illusion on his part because, you know, your predecessor tried to end, you know, my project, you know, and I installed you in his place for the sole purpose of keeping and protecting my plant, and you couldn't even do that. And Philip Price is like, your pet project, Angelo Moss, you know, that lawsuit, and then, you know, the other incident, um, basically was about to derail anything, and Philip Price was like, bitch. <laughs> that everything got resolved and, and he goes I shouldn't have to have told you basically he's like that doesn't make any sense you got what you wanted you have the Washington Township plan you have the Congo I went along with your 5-9 hat because I got it you know economic chaos creates you know economic wealth I went along with that I knew there was a pressure to get the Congo vote going I, I got that and you know and, you know, and, and White Rose also put, like, this little stinger in saying, you know, you know, I, well, I'm happy, you know, that, you know, China did, in fact, you know, sign the accord, the e-coin accord, you know. E-coin now is going to be the number one coin, you know, of the global currency. It's, prices are skyrocketing, and Philip Price is still looking at him like he's a mad, you know, she's a mad person, she, and she is, in a sense. Um, and he's like, you know... Is how does that help anything, you know? He goes, you know, E-Corp e is going to survive. You know, American sympathy is going to drive everything. People are going to rally around it, and, and, and E-Corp is going to survive. But even Phil Price, yes. But I'm not going to survive. That's the whole point of this conversation, bitch. Why did you come after me? And, and White Rose is basically like, because I had to tell you twice to do something. Petty shit like that. I had to tell you twice, and so that's why all these buildings had to fall. Um, this whole stage two, which was a kind of bit of a threat, which I think Philip Price kind of knew about, was because he had to tell Philip Price to protect his plant. And basically, your job is going to be from now on is you're going to tell, you're going to resign, and you're going to install your new CEO, the person I'm going to tell you to. And Philip Price, the hell I am. You know you're going to do it you're going to do it basically um and yeah uh wow because <laughs> i had to tell you twice fuck man fuck uh so let's talk about his pet project angela moss um they actually did little flashbacks you know which was interesting of the setup where uh, White Rose was like, you know, he she had to you get things done she didn't like, particularly how she had to interfere with Angela Moss and get her on her side, convince her to be with White Rose, which was a pretty much a false story. 
So there's been this theory for a while that Philip Price might in fact be Angela's father. He may well be, in fact. Um, there was a, a benefactor, if you will, from last episode during the flashback of Angela talking to her mom. Um, that whole flashback scene, you know, the, the benefactor was going to pay for everything for her to, for her the mother to have more treatments, but the mother said, no, she just she wanted to be her family and die. She's tired of the treatments. So that might be the case. Um, maybe after all this time, he's taking an interest in his kid. It's kind of weird. The family's weird like that. I don't know. Um, who knows? He's kind of an old guy. Maybe he could even be Angela's grandfather. I don't know. Um, but there, there's something there. And so Philip Price was very upset by the fact that, you know, once again, White Rose threatened Angela Moss. Excuse me. More so than he, him being threatened, and he basically said, "You're you're crazy. You're crazy. You know this whole plan, everything that's going to happen, and whatever next is going to come." <laughs> and you know, at this point, it's like White Rose is really the only one playing the game. Everyone else has been a piece on the board. It's White Rose playing the game, and controlling everything, controlling Philip Price, controlling Elliot, controlling F Society, the media, the, the, you know, the dark army, the FBI, manipulating governments, economics, like just controlling it all. And for what end game or purpose, whatever the hell, okay, so I'm back on the Washington Township plant is a MacGuffin. I really am. It's, I, I think it is. I know that you kind of showed it and sometimes you can show MacGuffins. Uh, I don't know. Quantum computer, robots, uh, coal butt drive, energy, whatever it is. It's, I think it's a MacGuffin. But whatever this driving thing is, it's just crazy. She's gotten this dark army cult where people literally kill themselves. Uh, kill Frederick and Tanya to fit the, fit the narrative that Iranian thing. Has Santiago in her pocket. I mean, she's playing all these different layers and levels. Is going to finance, you know, Donald Trump to be the next president. Um, installing all these things to get, you know, her whatever is in the Washington Township plant to the Congo. Have the Congo. Um, I wonder if that's going to go well, you know, annexing the Congo. I mean, what Chinese forces are going to have to hit the ground? to control another country that may not even want to have been annexed in the first place. There's going to be, it always happens, there's going to, going to be people that are going to rebel and fight with force um, through that. It might get actually bloody. But, you know, and keeping Elliot alive for some purpose until whatever that purpose is fulfilled and then he can die. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow ultimate villain and you know it's kind of hinted from the very beginning because uh when white rose uh first showed up she had like the kind of femme fatale ambiance and look about her and the femme fatale is always like the villain of the really the villain of the movie is really the villain of the entire thing set everything in motion to try to get what she wants it ends up getting caught in the end you know that's just the narrative rarely do femme fatale villains actually like um, get away with it, you know. I don't think I've ever seen a femme fatale film where they got away with it. Maybe Brick. Maybe Brick might have been the one where the femme fatale actually got away with it because it wasn't provable. But, or maybe that's just because they didn't, didn't see her get away with it, the handcuffs, even though um, Joseph gordon Lett's character uh, called out the femme fatale and forgetting the actress name I kind of like her I've seen her in a few other things but basically she's the femme fatale she's in we should have known from the very beginning that she was like the main villain of all of this and again this talks about the layers and the you know the ambiance and the 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 uh, cinematic key hints that Sam Esmail has layered throughout this both in the writing and the directing that kind of builds up to where things make sense it makes sense I don't know again I don't know I don't know where they're going I don't know and it's fine it's fine we can be going off a cliff and it'll be ah and I'll probably be like bitching why did I watch this show I just don't think that's the case I think things are just 
well planned enough and because each of these seasons are very short you know they're not 22 episodes they're like you know 10 like 10 I think it was like 11 and 10 now and 10 10 that it's possible to make these very compact seasons that have their own eternal logic build off the previous seasons and still fit with the overall series narrative um, which is great and this which 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 is the direction I think television or at least American television is going uh, British television and um, globally and worldwide that that television's been pretty much been like that for a very long time um, you look at through the Korean television shows I mean they're pretty breathtaking amazing um, especially some of their rom-coms and romantic um, Korean shows um, British shows, again, been doing it for decades. They have shorter series, shorter seasons, stuff because like only one or two, three series, as they call them. Not very long. Sometimes they're like kind of TV movie-ish deals. Um, but, you know, this is, you know, the direction television is going, which is great. It makes it bingeable. It makes it watchable. It makes it week to week. This is one of the very few shows that I actually like watching week to week. The only other show that I um, actually review is Star Trek Discovery. And um, I like the show, but... CBS Access could have just, I could have binged it. I could have binged all nine episodes and I would probably preferred it better. Um, the anticipation level is not the same as this show where there's like a, like a, a junky need and oh wait, kind of a deal where once I get the hit, I'm, I'm happy for a while, go through withdrawals and then I need that next hit. Um, probably bad analogy, sorry. Uh, but it just speaks to why Rose is planning her intellect. She's been doing this since what well, we think the Washington Township started around 88. Definitely 95 is when things were completed with the death of Elliot's father and the CEO at the same time. The lawsuits occurred earlier. The death of uh, Angela Moss's mother was like 93. So she's been doing 88, 98, 2008, almost 2018 for, for 30 years. She's been with this plan, with this notion, and Elliot's idea or plan really to take down uh, E Corp solved a solution of something they were attempting or trying to do themselves but couldn't actually fit to happen, and his was the be better plan. So I think they need to, I need, think they need to show, maybe they won't ever show it, like a master plan. I don't know if it's like a board even if it's a crazy board or drawings, a painting, something of White Rose mapping all this out, all the different pieces and the layers and the intricacies of getting this and moving this and making this happen. Uh, it's just very impressive, this game player, White Rose, what she has done. Um, I still think there's still a stage three attack, even though they've, they've taken out Trenton and Moby and it looks like a like, kind of false attack to kind of wrap up the F Society narrative, I still think there might be something else that will happen. Um, oh, and another thing, White Rose threatened L uh, Philip Price that nothing is going to happen to his plant, period, end of story, as his time as CEO. So it will be interesting to see if Philip Price is going to comply, if he gets taken out, maybe his last act of being a petty as, Phil, as White Rose might be doing something to the Washington Township plant. I don't know if that's even possible without White Rose being aware or knowing it or counteracting it. Uh, I think Philip Price is pretty much in a box. He's done. But sometimes when you put people in a corner, they can surprise you. And um, I don't... Sh White Rose doesn't strike me as somebody who um, underestimates people. But maybe at this point, uh, having all the wins that she's won, she might be a little bit hubris. Um, maybe she might have overreached. Uh, we'll see. Who knows if America will react in the way that they think they will with the Iranian narrative. Um, starting another war in the Middle East. One that would be nukes. Um, we'll see. Um, that's pretty much it. So I have my thoughts on it. Oh, last bit. Trenton and Mo Trenton's email. I think it's going to be key. I think it's going to be the last hurrah of Trenton, if you will. I think it might actually be the actual cryptographic keys that will unlock 
uh, E Corps um, servers. I don't know what that will do to E Corp, and maybe that's what Y Rose was hinting at how E Corp will still bounce back as a company because um, the paper records are done, but they'll get back the digital records both in China and in the US. Uh, or just US ones because Philip Price gets a little petty. Uh, that would still solidify E Corp as a stable company. Um, still a bit wrecked, but given the fact that the overall global economy is wrecked in and of itself, um, and with E Coin surging and everyone agreeing to it, yeah, um, who knows? Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if that'll be a curveball or still fit in with White Rose's plan. So we have three episodes to figure it and find out, you know, if uh, Trent was a uh, FBI informant. Did she, did she send it to Dom? Did she send it to somebody else? Do we have any time in the next three episodes to uh, get involved with another character? Um, or is it a character that we known, have seen, and haven't seen in a while? Um, could be Darlene. Um, I don't know. But we'll see. Uh, it's definitely not Romero. Romero's dead. Um, so that's it. It could be her brother. Um, I don't know if we saw her brother. We saw her parents and some small kids. It could be her brother. She trusts her brother. She was worried about her brother saying her brother's freaking out in that car. And when he's like, your brother's freaking out? We're tied up in his car with a psychopath. Uh, it could be your brother and we might, um, we might finally get our, someone to act in the vengeance pack, if you will. Uh, a different sibling, um, bond, if you will, um, on this, on this show. We'll see. But that's it. That's my review. Uh, thank you for listening, friends. And, um, until next time. Oh, Facebook giveaway. Facebook giveaway, um, number four for episode eight is going to be the trunk, um, prescription service that Elliot had utilized a $50 gift card uh, will be given to the winner so you have to have been part of the Facebook group before 10 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday December 3rd I think that Wednesday where episode 8 airs um, that's when I will do the random generator name and do the next giveaway so and there's already been a give already given away for the Redwood Wheelbarrow and the the winner has been notified uh, as the holiday so we'll see when they get back but there's been a winner declared there so thank you very again friends for listening as Rosie Shad blogging off and until next time.